Fed worries about inflation. When nominal GDP growth is weak, they'll have a whole host of other problems to contend with. I don't agree with the view that the Fed's going to be cutting rates by the end of the year. You have a Federal Reserve that says we're not done hiking. We have more work to do. I don't think we should feel comfortable that the worst has passed us. It is particularly a period of heightened uncertainty around the outlook. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, live from the IMF Spring Meetings in Washington, D.C., with Tom Keene, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from the nation's capital for our audience worldwide. Good morning, good morning to you all. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio from IMF HQ. In a couple of minutes' time, we'll catch up with Gita Gopinath from the International Monetary Fund. The meetings continue down here in Washington, D.C. Going into this morning, equity futures were slightly positive. Just turning over in the last couple of minutes, we are negative on the S&P 500. Tom, a ton of fantastic guests lined up. We need to talk about the data, though, which we get in about 29 yes. minutes' time. Data front and center here. I want to note that the futures rolled over because they knew Mike Wilson would be on here uh, in moments. But the answer here is claims at 830 has a renewed importance. Lisa mentioned it earlier. There were adjustments. The McKee understands this. I don't, folks, to be honest. But there were adjustments made last week. And we now need to see do those adjustments continue their trend to more claims and potentially higher joblessness. A breakout last week off the back of those adjustments. There's a difference between levels and change. The levels are still historically exceptionally oh, low. Oh, yeah, Tom. absolutely. Exceptionally low. But that change will get right. your attention if we get that snapping back again. Yeah, really well said. And the point here is the pros are looking at not the 190 or the 228 level, 225 level. They need to see stress 100,000 up at 310, 325 level. We're a long way from that, but it, it's the vector. It's the movement up that matters. The Fed likes to talk about the totality of the data, Lisa. So let's talk about the totality of the data, X non-farm payrolls. If you took payrolls out, the data last week, miss, 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 week, 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 and then bank lending data dreadful. That doesn't look good, does it? Well, that gave people confidence that the Fed was going to cut by 100 basis points in the next 10 months, and that all of a sudden, bang, everything is over with respect to tightening, and we're heading right back to zero. I mean, seriously, people were talking suddenly in a completely different light, and that's the reason why there are these whipsaws that are historic in the bond market, the most deep and liquid market out there. So here's the question. Have we truly reset? Are some of the pressures that we have seen <clears throat> truly disinflationary enough to remove inflation from the picture. You've got some doubts about that. You've been asking that question no. over the well, last couple of days. I know. I, I really I think that there is an increasing breach between the people who believe the Fed has to go further and those who think they should hold. And that unspoken reality is those that are more comfortable with inflation remaining higher for oh. longer and those who want to see it come down to 2% more rapidly. In, in That's the, the difference. And the zeitgeist of the last 48 hours is a reset on wage growth, and we've heard this from a number of our guests this morning, and you can, you know, you can take the statistics and make whatever you want from them, but I think a lot of Americans on radio and television right now would say, you know what, there was that moment, that glimmer of substantial nominal wage growth. It's vapored in the last three months. We'll be Go with on. you through the next couple of hours, continuing to cover some of these themes, coming up on an extended version of Bloomberg Surveillance for the next two hours or so. Gita Gopinath of the International Monetary Fund joining us in the next 10 minutes. Paolo Gentiloni of the European Commission. Raghu Raja of the University of Chicago Booth School, Tom, formerly, of course, of the Central Bank in India. Timely as well in the setup for the equity markets here. It does dovetail completely into the equity uh, markets. Why don't you bring in our esteemed guest for the Thursday adjustment? Mike Wilson, the chief U.S. equity strategist and chief investment officer over at Morgan Stanley, joins us right now. Mike, wonderful to have you with us on the program. It's always good to see you, buddy. Let's talk about what we're going to hear tomorrow, bank earnings. Earnings season has arrived. Mike, is this the one where they have to tank guidance because of what we've seen develop over the last month? Hey, good morning, guys. Good to see you as usual. Uh, look, I, I think that this earnings season will bring what it's been bringing the whole time. I mean, I don't think it's that different. We're going to see uh, earnings come down again for the second quarter. Right? They're, you know, we're going to jump over this lowered bar that has come down by about 7% for the first quarter. That's S&P overall. And I do think the banks are going to be you know, uh, a greater uh, center of attention for obvious reasons. And I think the, the more important commentary from the banks is going to be, what are they doing with their lending standards? You know, what are they, how are they thinking about credit, you know, creation, um, more, even more so than what they guide to, okay? Um, I think, the, I think you know, th those stocks have been hit pretty hard. Is it, in other words, they've already priced uh, earnings degradation for the banks. 
our focus mm -hmm. now as equity strategists is what's the impact going to be on the broader economy? Because that, that part of the market is holding up. You know, I mean, small cap stocks have obviously taken it on the chin. Anything that needs uh, capital uh, on a regular basis has uh, been punished. But, you know, the S&P 500 is hanging around as, you know, people rotate to other areas. But look, if we're going to have a, a sharp, you know, contraction in credit availability and, and, and a credit crunch, as I expect, over the next 12 months, then, you know, it's going gonna, it's gonna to hit a broader group of stocks. And so, to me, the focus for me is going to be on like, how, how does the rest of the market trade on the back of their commentary around credit creation. Mike Wilson, do you partition to changing the weight of equities or is there an immediate efficacy to go to all cash or mostly cash? How do you split the two? Well, first of all, I, we would never recommend to individual investors or asset you know, owners to go to 100 percent cash. I mean, that's not a practical strategy for for anybody because, A, you could be wrong in your assumptions and nobody can predict the future. But more importantly, that's not the environment we envision for the next several years. So we've had this view for a long time, as you guys know. We're, we're in the kind of, you know, boom, bust, boom camp, which means that, you know, after we get through this slowdown that we're going through and may lead to a recession and, you know, slowdown in various parts of the economy, there's going to be another boom to look forward to. And so I think this is one of the reasons why the equity market has not given it up yet, because I think, I think people kind of agree with that view that we've had. And they're looking forward. They're saying, look, I don't want to miss the next upturn. Um, we're willing to miss some of that uh, more than other people because we think the pullback will be more significant. Um, but, you know, we don't go 100 percent cash time. You know, that would be impractical. But we have a high percentage of cash right now because you're getting paid to hold it. Given the fact, Mike, that you have seen such resilience in the market, even in the face of what you said already, is what we have been seeing, which is relatively weak earnings. Have you revised upward your target for the S&P, where, say, the 3,200 bear case isn't really at play anymore? Well, look, the way we look at the, the, the world and the markets is we have a, 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 a sort of a 12-month view, and then we have a, you know, a shorter-term kind of tactical view. And on the, on the sort of year-end target prices, we haven't budget those because we think those are still accurate. You know, 3,900 is our base case for a year end, 4,200 uh, bull case, and then a 3,600 bear case. Um, th those are in place. Okay. Th those have not changed. The tactical trading path, what we've gotten wrong this year is the timing of it. We don't think the path is necessarily wrong. We've put, we put those targets of 3,000 3,300 for a trough for this cycle in May of last year. Okay. So that, that, that has not changed. And, and but, we, you know, calling the, the price and the time I mean, it's hard enough to get one right. To get both right, I think, is tricky. So we've been wrong on the timing for sure, but it doesn't change our view that that, that low end of the range, that path to 3,900, we think, still goes through kind of low 3,000s ultimately. How difficult has it made your job, Mike, to see the volatility in the rates market persist to the same degree that we've seen over the past few months? Well, I mean, I think rate volatility leads equity volatility. I mean, rate, you know, the rate, the rates market, I think, have moved away from the equity market view that uh, the banking uh, stress is going to lead to a credit crunch and probably, you know, a situation where the Fed's cutting rates because there's a recession. And the equity market is not priced that at all. So, you know, make, you can place your bets. Who do you, you know, who do you want to kind of get, lean with? Um, you know, we're in the earnings recession camp. So whether we have an economic recession or not, I think, you know, isn't as important as the earnings recession. And we're highly confident right. now that that's going to happen, that the earnings, the earnings situation is way worse than what the consensus thinks, which is more in line with what we've been saying all along. And the banking stress only makes us more confident right. in that view. So, Mike, to get specific here, and I don't want you to talk individual names, but if there's seven stocks that are the stock market right now, do you sell? I mean, I'm assuming I'm not buying more of those right now, given a Mike Wilson view. But do you sell it and do something else? Do you put in a put play to protect the downside? What do you do if you've got gains in glorious big tech? Well, look, first of all, those seven stocks are not all tech companies. But what I would say is that they are cyclical companies uh, in the sense that they are all tied to the economic outcome. And I think that is where we would differ from most people. We would say, look, these are high quality businesses, some of them, not all of them. And uh, and, but they're very tied to the economic outcome and the earnings growth situation that we see and their customers and, and their situation. So, look, if you have great gains in, in these various companies, it's so different than last year, Tom. OK, you, you just want to make sure you don't have you know, too much exposure to any particular areas of the market that we think get hurt in a economic slowdown that we're envisioning. And, and, and look, I mean, once again, 
that means holding more cash. It means not having concentrated positions and things that are probably extended. Um, you know, and for people who have tax consequences, which is a large part of your listening, you know, audience, I would say, you know, I mean, maybe you don't sell because you don't want to pay the tax if you believe in the intermediate term view. What I would, what I think the most important message though is just remember that the winners of the last cycle are typically not the winners of the next cycle. And these are very large market cap companies. So you do need to be selective and say, well, there's seven or eight here. I probably should think about two that make it, that not all seven are gonna make it as leaders in the next bull market. Mike, just quickly here, we're at the IMF in DC and I'm wondering how you incorporate some of these more official group projections in what you do. Well, I don't want to sound, you know, as if we ignore everything, but we, we have to focus on our own. <laughs> I mean, we, we, we can't rely on other people to do our forecasting for us. I think, to be honest, I mean, I think that is part of the issue we have in not just fixed income markets, but also in equity markets, is I think we've, we've moved to a world where the dispersion of forecasting is very narrow. And this is why when when things, when the surprise, come, when, when the data comes in that's not in line with the tight forecast, the move, the volatility moves can be greater. Okay, so, um, you know, like I, we have our own forecast. We're very confident, as confident as we can be in this, you know, sort of fortune telling business that we're in. Um, but we, we do our own work and we have to do it that way. Mike, that was perfect. Just perfectly answered. It's Mike Wilson, Morgan Stanley, with Guido Kopenhaf just around the corner. Yeah. Mike Wilson, do you care about IMF forecasts? Well, I, I'm do you curious. Really give a damn what Guido <laughs> no, Kopenhaf says? Look, I think it's important to understand sure. the divergence <clears throat> between Wall Street and some of the policymakers and how they're coming up with their projections. Yeah. That's good. Guido Kopenhaf, the IMF, the Deputy Managing Director, joining us next. Equity futures on the S&P 500 unchanged from the IMF's global headquarters in Washington, D.C. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. The White House is rejecting an outlook for the economy by Federal Reserve staff. Fed Minutes published on Wednesday said the staff sees a mild recession starting later this year. But a White House spokeswoman says that the data doesn't indicate that, pointing out recent numbers on jobs and consumer spending. Last week's production cuts by OPEC plus nations will lead to a hefty oil shortfall that will grow as the year progresses. That's according to data from the cartel. A new report says world markets may be undersupplied by about 2 million barrels a day in the fourth quarter. In China, exports unexpectedly rose in March. They jumped 14.8 percent in U.S. dollar terms from a year earlier. Demand from Europe and most Asian countries improved. That boosts the economy's outlook and indicates global growth may be better than expected. A federal appeals court will allow limited access to the abortion pill. A three-judge panel partly granted the Biden administration's request to put on hold a Texas court ruling that overturned FDA approval for the medication. On the other hand, it allowed restrictions on abortion that were lifted since 2016 to be reinstated. Delta Airlines is expecting profit this quarter to beat Wall Street estimates. The carrier sees steady bookings heading into the summer travel season. Delta also reiterated its full year forecast of 15 to 20 percent revenue growth over 2022. Global News, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. Financial conditions have tightened to some extent, but it's really in the banking sector mm -hmm. that we have seen most of, of, of the tightening, and that could have consequences down the line for macro activity. Central banks have to fight inflation and have to keep monetary policy tight, but over time we do expect uh, interest rates to come back down to our star, which we estimate to be similar to pre-COVID. That's the call from the International Monetary Fund. That was Tobias Adrian, the IMF Director of Monetary and Capital Markets. Live from Washington, D.C. this morning. Good morning to you all. Counting you down to the opening bell about an hour and 14 minutes from now. Equity futures on the S&P 500 shaping up as follows. Positive, just about by not even a tenth of 1% on the S&P 500. The smallest of lifts up 0.05% this morning. Yields bleeding just a little bit higher by four basis points on a 10-year 343.36. The news this morning, euro dollar reclaiming one tenth 
on the euro against the US dollar. Tom, 110.18. We're positive here by two tenths of 1%. Stronger euro in a mix, a weaker dollar. And if we get the reach in euro, that's something we're not expecting. It's out, it's percolating among strategists, but I don't think it's in the zeitgeist right now. Truly weak dollar. 110.33, the previous intraday high of the year so far in early February, I think the same day the ECB met, and that was the day before that blowout jobs report. Do you yeah. remember that? North of 500K on payrolls. And still the there are after. 1 million U.S. jobs in the last 90 hey, it's days. It's been impressive. It's a terrible economy. 3.5% unemployment. It's in the IMF survey five years out. 500,000 gloom. gloom. It's there. Right now, an annual visit as we do at these spring meetings with Gita Gopinath, first deputy managing director at the International uh, Monetary Fund. And what she, she has done critically in the last 90 days is drive forward the discussion of crisis and monetary policy and how we're going to extract ourselves from this mess. Dr. Gopinath, thank you so much for joining uh, this morning. You mentioned, buried in your wonderful essay, this scary idea that inflation becomes unanchored. Is inflation unanchored at this point? No, not at this point. I think if you look at the data, it's squarely anchored in the U.S. and in Europe and several other countries. That is not a concern right now. The concern right now off of the five-year forecast, it's your fault. We all know that. But the IMF five-year forecast that we have is 3% or even lower. The World Bank even set a little bit lower means a disinflation. It means a lower rate regime. If we have an, an unanchored or an anchored disinflation, does that lead to financial stability within your forecast? If inflation expectations de-anchor, there are multiple problems associated with that. Firstly, interest rates go up. Policy rates have to rise much faster to bring inflation down. And that can generate much greater financial stress than we have seen. With consequences not just for the country where the tightening is happening, but if you're a large economy, it would spill over mm -hmm. to the rest of the world. So that could be very consequential. And it's one of the downside scenarios we have in our world economic outlook, which is if interest rates have to go up much faster and you have much more tightening, you could end up with global growth going as low as, say, 1%, which is, would be very bad. So what is the nominal GDP separation of the IMF five-year forecast? Is it for a dropping disinflation, a lower inflation, and with it, lower real GDP, bringing us down to a truly subdued nominal GDP? No, we have, uh, our expectation is that inflation will be conquered in, over time. It's not going to happen immediately. But if you go into 2024, you're going to see inflation around the world getting much closer to central bank targets. Real growth is going to slow also because we don't have any Chinas anymore that are growing at very high rates. So for the global economy as a whole, we don't have very large engines of growth. So that's generating the weakness in real growth, also because we have aging demographics. So unless we can find a way to raise productivity, you know, we are going to struggle with low growth. How controversial has your call been that inflation is going to get back down to where it was close to pre-pandemic even by 2024? You know, if you look at forecasts and if you look at market expectations in the U.S., you see an even more rapid fall in inflation that's expected. So we're actually on the side of being a little more cautious about how long it's going to take to bring inflation down. But we think the policies will work. There's been some very substantial increase in interest rates. We are seeing now that show up in terms of high frequency data, the slowing of the economy. And we think that will bring down inflation, but it will take time. Do you think that the balance of risk has shifted since what we saw with Silicon Valley Bank and with some of the other banking institutions and the huge drop off in lending that we've seen peripherally in initial data, that the balance of risks has shifted to perhaps have monetary officials be a little less aggressive when it comes to rate hikes and to err on the side of pausing or even cutting? Well, as always, central banks need to take into account how economic conditions look. And with the financial stress, you've had a tightening in financial conditions. Bank lending standards have tightened. Smaller banks' credit has weakened. And that will slow the economy down to some extent, which is why central banks may have to do less. But again, I think we're still waiting for more data to show up to know exactly how much of of an effect that's had. Gita, there's a bit of tension between what the IMF has communicated this week and what politicians have responded with. Chancellor Hunt told us yesterday 
that he disagrees with your forecast. He's entitled to disagree with it. I spoke and we spoke to Tobias Adrian literally in the last hour, and he said he sees evidence of lending, bank lending contracting in America. Secretary Yellen says she doesn't see evidence of that. How do you explain the daylight between what your institution is saying and what po politicians are saying back? So, firstly, I think if you look at the numbers, we're not that far apart, right? So, for instance, in the case of the UK, I think what uh, Jeremy Hunter would recognize is that we've actually had a substantial upgrade for UK for this year. It's just that we haven't gone as high as maybe some of the other forecasts are. But we've actually seen things turn out better than expected in the UK. In the case of credit conditions, again, I think the difference is that Tobias was pointing to all of credit supply, not just from the large banks. And so you see that in the smaller banks, you see certainly credit supply slowing. But if you look at the large banks, indeed, you know, credit is holding up. So you don't believe the Treasury Secretary is misleading us when she says things <clears throat> like she doesn't see evidence of bank lending contracting? I think that's a, the description that, especially if you look at large banks, you are seeing credit holding up is an accurate uh, representation, again, of the data at this point. I, I look at where we are, and I wonder of the textbooks and the theory that's out there. It seems like everybody's post-pandemic supply-driven dynamics making it up as they go. And the day-to-day Gopinath grind of putting together the blue book the world economic outlook, how much are you relying on a traditional economics versus going, it's a whole new world after all? Well, I think there are parts that are new and then there are parts that are old and stay the same. So we're using a combination of models, but also going beyond... Is them. our start a valid model right now? You and I are going to be with Olivier Blanchard tomorrow. He's trumpeting the dynamics of our start. Is it useful? Is there an efficacy... Tradition, to traditional John Williams economics thing? I think it's a very useful input in thinking about how to fashion a monetary policy and also fiscal policy. I think, it, again, it's an input. You cannot be... That cannot be the only thing one is focused on. I think that's what the pandemic and the war has taught us. A lot of people say that this group of meetings is somewhat different in nature than previous ones, just because we feel like we're on the precipice of some sort of turning point, either back to what we came from or something new. How would you characterize it in terms of how these meetings are different? I think this meeting is different in the extent that I think we are in this period where, after all the monetary policy tightening that's happened, we are seeing the effect of it because we know all this tightening works with a lag. So I think this is the lag and we're seeing it play out now. There are concerns about how this could play out. You know, as of now, financial policy tools have worked well in being able to calm markets. But there are risks that are out there. The second aspect is we are looking at a period where growth in the world is not going to go back to the 3.8% it used to be, but more 3%. And lastly, we have many vulnerable economies around the world with very high levels of debt and could be in, in debt distress. So, you know, I think we have to all, first of all, recognize that the world economy did better than expected last year. It showed much stronger resilience. We still have tight labor markets. Consumption spending is still holding up. But that said, the balance of risks are squarely to the downside. That last point is so important. Gita Gopinath of the IMF. Gita, thank you. As always, thank it's you. good to catch up and good to see you in person. Tom, the resilience of the U.S. labor market, to be specific, has been a standout, I would say, over the last six months for sure. That without question, and all those statistics matter, many say these weekly claims are front and center. Jobless claims up next from Washington. This is Bloomberg. <laughs>
Well, John, we seem to be uh, seeing the same pattern in jobless claims that we saw before last week with uh, unemployment claims, first-time claims up 239,000. Remember, last week it was initially reported as 228,000, and that is uh, now uh, over the previous... Yeah, it is unrevised. So, basically, uh, we're seeing uh, claims in a range. <clears throat> Remember, last week... The uh, Labor Department adjusted the seasonal adjustment factors to uh, try to get some of the pandemic distortions out, and that pushed us up by about 48,000. But if we're uh, staying at the same level here, we're not seeing a major increase in claims. And so it tells sort of the same story that the labor market is doing okay. Continuing claims actually fall 1,810,000 from 1,823,000. So stability in the labor market from claims. And the other number out this morning is uh, PPI, and this is good news on the Fed front, at least for those who think the Fed is getting something done. Uh, final demand PPI, the headline number, comes down uh, five-tenths of a percent. It was uh, down a tenth the prior month, and it, is, uh, it was expected to come wow. in flat. That puts the year-over-year -year number at 2.7 percent, down from 4.6. The core rate of uh, wow. just subtracting food and energy down a tenth. The uh, core rate, food, energy, and trade services, which is retailer, wholesaler margins, uh, up just a tenth of a percent. The uh, core year-over-year -year is 3.4 percent, and the uh, core, including uh, trade, is 3.6 percent. Let me just mention quickly here the year-over-year -year headline number revised up to 4.9 percent for the month of February. So an even bigger drop to 2.7 percent. We've really seen prices come down at the factory gate, as they would say, uh, over the last month. And so this has got to be good news for the Fed. Doesn't necessarily translate directly into CPI, but it does suggest that inflation is going in the right direction. True, true. Mike McKee, stay close. We'll run through this data and push it through the equity market and the bond market as well. A couple of ingredients here. On the labour market side, a bit softer, jobless claims a little bit higher. You look at the disinflationary trends in PPI, you put those two ingredients together and you get the smallest of bids in the bond market. Yields come back down just a little bit by a basis point or two on a two-year to 3.94. On a 10-year, yields were a little bit higher still, just a touch higher by a single basis point. We take back some of that inversion on twos, tens. That spread negative 53 and up a couple of basis points on a session. If you want to check out the equity market off the back of this information, equity futures with the smallest of pops, Tom, off the back of this. Equity futures positive yeah. by, let's call it, a quarter of 1%. The movement here is just as Mike McKee says, it's Fed friendly and it, it speaks to a disinflation. But Michael McKee, I've got to go back to you before we get to Vince Reinhardt. How much information does this Fed need? I mean, I'm seeing the zeitgeist today framing wage growth that is a generalization has been cut in half. I'm seeing PPI is a generalization been cut in half, et cetera. Isn't that enough to make them change, as we heard from Goldman Sachs this morning? Well, the Fed is going to want to have several months of this kind of data. Uh, it certainly is going in the right direction, and it's certainly playing out as they anticipated. The CPI yesterday with the big drop in rents, uh, if that continues, we are going to see them get down into the threes perhaps by the end of the year, which is where they anticipated being. Uh, the PPI playing out as anticipated, but maybe even a little more so. Uh, the two-thirds of the decline in the index attributed to a drop in goods prices, which we knew had been happening. But listen to this. The index for final demand services fell three-tenths of a percent. Services wow. was the area that the Fed is most worried about. So we are seeing prices come off the boil. The question is, does it continue and does that stabilize wages? Mike McKee, thank you, sir. Let's return to those markets. Equity futures on the S&P 500 off the back of the higher than expected jobless claims, positive two-tenths of 1%. I talked about that small move at the front of the yield curve, the two-year yield coming in by not even a basis point now. But the move in the FX market just continues to stick. So literally in the last 60 seconds or so, 110.43, the previous intraday high of the year, 110.33, which is where we are right now, but moments ago, Tom, 110.43 right. on euro dollar. That's euro strength, dollar weakness. That's the strongest euro against the dollar 
of the year so far. Mario, you, you were looking at that. I was trying. John and I do things together, folks. You were, I was triangulating the yen, and we're not where euro is stronger through yen, which is a 147, dare I say, a 148 yen per euro. We're not there yet, but as you say, we're buttressed right up in that case on resistance. Elisa, breathing some life into that dollar weakness story with this data. That this really is about dollar weakness. It's not necessarily about euro strength. And you're seeing, if you look at the Bloomberg dollar index, uh, you see it close to the weakest level uh, of the year. But if you could see uh, that, that DXY goes back to also April of 2022. Mm -hmm. So this is a dollar weakness type of story. Joining us now in really well-timed off this economic data is Vincent Reinhardt, to say chief economist at Dreyfus and Mellon barely describes his contribution to the Federal Reserve System. As head of research for Alan Greenspan, for years and years, I can make sure he was a director of adverbs at the Federal Reserve. Vincent, thank you so much for joining us. There is that word out there, suddenly. And you and I know that when you get slowdowns, they usually happen suddenly. Are we at the beginning or the middle of suddenly for this Fed? I think we're at turning the corner towards suddenly, and we're not quite sure what's around the other, uh, down the end of the block. The plain fact is that business cycle is uneven, irregular, uh, a word you would like, uh, uh, it, uh, you know, quite dynamically uh, 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 driven. And, and when the unemployment rate starts rising, it tends to keep rising. Uh, you don't see it at first, you just see the dribs and the drabs, and then it happens, happens all at once. That's how you could have the Federal Reserve staff forecasting a mild recession, even as we're getting data like Mike just reported. Pretty good, <clears throat> an economy that still has some momentum. All right. Vincent Reinhardt, Orphanides at the Fed, 21 years ago, writing about the great inflation. We have had a sudden pandemic-driven great inflation. Can you state that the great inflation of the last two years, three years, is over? Uh, I got the headline you kept repeating, inflation is halved, but I keep having to remember where it started, 9%. Uh, we can't declare victory yet. The great inflation isn't over until the Fed says it is because they don't need to raise rates anymore. Uh, once we got a, 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 a run in which inflation is close to goal and people don't care much about inflation, uh, then it's behind us. Well, Vincent, let's talk about what threshold it will be okay for inflation to fall down to. Are we seeing a greater acceptance, perhaps in uh, you know backroom discussions, of a three percent inflation rate rather than say a two percent target? I think that's the real risk that the Fed declares victory too early because it's harder to do otherwise. Uh, Chair Powell says two percent's the goal. Uh, I'm inclined to believe him. That's his definition of price stability. But it will get harder from here on as the unemployment rate starts rising, as inflation is no longer as material threat to economic expansion and people's well-being. I think you, you raise the issue. What happens in about three, four months when we get another string of good readings on inflation and troubling readings on unemployment? The Fed may declare a victory. The problem is uh, not that 2 percent is, is you know, immutable. They didn't really have a great discussion of def defining price stability as 2 percent. It's, however, having drawn the line in the sand, you lose credibility if you don't uh, uh, act as it is important. So, Vincent, you know, we're here at the IMF in Washington, D.C., at the, at the spring meetings, and there is a belief here that inflation will naturally gravitate back to the pre-pandemic levels and that monetary policy will return also to similar types of ultra-low rates. Do you disagree? Do you think that there is a structural component to inflation that is underappreciated in some of these estimates and, frankly, baked into the market? So I think there's a couple things going on. The IMF... Uh, and, and, and a lot of analysts think we'll go back to the new normal or the old new normal. I'm, I'm running out of adjectives there. Um, and rates will be low. Uh, 
that's possible, but look, uh, for most of history, rates have been were higher. The, the anomaly was having a Fed-driven lower for longer episode that suppressed nominal interest rates and kept the real federal funds rate negative. We've broken out of that. Yeah. Uh, not obvious we can get back to it. Vince Reinhardt of Dreyfus and Mellon. Vince, wonderful to have your perspective and that view as well. Pushing back against some <clears> of the views here at the International Monetary Fund, right here at the headquarters of the IMF, and this is their view. That yeah. Somehow rates go back to this pre-pandemic story. And to Vince's point, it was the last 10 years that were the aberration, the last decade. That was the... Uh, the new normal, so to speak, and Vince is suggesting that maybe we go back to the On an institutional normal. basis, he's always going to support his Fed. And believe me, folks, it was Vincent Reinhardt's uh, Fed. The research capability they put together was first rate. But I agree with you. Yeah, they're making forecasts at the IMF, but institutions have to live it, and the institutions just aren't there yet looking out to 25, a draggy 25, or dare I say even 24. They're not there yet. Let's just recap some of the data. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program. So what we have here is jobless claims a little bit higher than expected, 239,000. The estimate, 235. PPI, factory gate inflation. PPI, Lisa, falling in March by the most since the start of the pandemic. That's the lead paragraph from Reed Pickett here at Bloomberg this and, morning. And that really is the lead for the market reaction as well, where you see yields uh, marginally lower and you have this sort of, you know, tepid pop in equities. But it's not overwhelmingly excited because, frankly, we are seeing weakness in the economy. Does this read through to CPI? Is this enough disinflation? Yep. I mean, we knew that there would be disinflation, but where does it go? There's a big question in Washington. Does Europe have a coherent view on China? Coming up next, Paolo Gentiloni, the EU Commissioner for the Economy and Financial Affairs. That conversation, up next. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Fed officials feel they need to do a little more to tame inflation and are leaning toward another interest rate hike next month. That's according to minutes from their March meeting. This despite forecasts from Fed staff advisors that say there will be a mild recession later this year. Another missile launch from North Korea. A suspected intercontinental ballistic missile was fired toward waters off Japan's northern island of Hokkaido. That prompted a brief warning from residents to take shelter. South Korea says it's possible that North Korea may have tested a new type of solid fuel missile. There's a report on the alleged leaker of those U.S. intelligence secrets. According to The Washington Post, it's a young gun enthusiast who worked on a military base and shared the classified documents with a group on Discord, an online platform that's used by gamers. He was known as OG and told the group he spent some time inside a secure facility. Discord says it's cooperating with authorities. And SoftBank is cashing in on its long-held stake in Alibaba. It sold $7.3 billion in shares of the Chinese internet giant this year. That's after selling billions more in shares last year. SoftBank once owned a third of Alibaba. Most of that came from early $20 million investment in one venture capital's most famous bets. And Delta Airlines is expecting profit this quarter to beat Wall Street estimates. The carrier sees steady bookings heading into the summer travel season. Delta also reiterated its full year forecast of 15 to 20 percent revenue growth over 2022. Global News powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo and this is Bloomberg. In effect, the central banks were buying giant d duration. And so what right. that meant is it distorted all world markets and we're now in the workout phase. There'll have to be a normalization of interest rates. It means at the pressure on asset prices for a long period of time. That was David Malpass, the president of the World Bank, joining us here at IMF HQ in Washington, D.C. From Washington this morning, good morning to you all. Also counting you down to the opening bell about 44 minutes from now with equity futures on the S&P 500 positive by a third of 1%. Literally about 16 minutes ago, we had some economic data out of the United States. Jobless claims a little bit higher than expected. 
PPI, factory gate inflation, coming in a little bit softer than expected. That breathing some life into the equity market, taking some life away from the US dollar. Euro dollar breaking out to 110.43 at one point. New intraday high for the year on the euro against the US dollar. Tom, right now 110.30. The euro stronger, dollar weaker. Euro stronger by a third of 1%. Euro movie, we've been talking about it all morning in a weaker US dollar and maybe where we'll be three months or even three years from now. There is a longer time frame here. But far more importantly is the outrageous demand of the Bloomberg surveillance team that we focus on what matters right now. And so as we introduce our next guest, John, I think it's just wonderful that Ted Lasso has taken an Italian play off AC Milan oh, right, to bring okay. a new character in. But the tensions, as I saw Real Madrid play Chelsea yesterday, and the tensions of your AC Milan, and is it Juventus is how you pronounce it? Well, the, the commissioner supports Juventus, but ultimately yeah. I don't think he wants to talk about his beloved Juve this morning. It, it so. may not be, but it shows the tensions that are out there <laughs> We want right to keep now. our the guests on the of the moment. <laughs> There's good reason for that. Paolo Gentiloni joins us now, the EU Commissioner for Economy and Financial Affairs. <sighs> commissioner, good morning. Good morning. We won't talk about Juve, don't worry about yeah, it. Yeah. I Next want to time. talk about something much more <laughs> difficult. Let's start with this question. Does Europe have a coherent approach to China? And if you do, what is it? Well, I think we do have. This is the obvious uh, answer. Uh, it has uh, evolved, this attitude, since uh, three, four years. Uh, our attitude until three, four years ago was the attitude of, well, we have uh, important trade relations and whatever they are, we will uh, strengthen these trade relations. Um, now I think we are very clearly um, on the perspective to rebalance these trade relations, uh, to also uh, leave behind a certain ingenuity that we had in hoping that these trade relations in themselves uh, would uh, be um, in, a, in an equal treatment, in a level playing field, which was not completely the case. So we are still uh, cooperating economically, but we have also a, a geopolitical uh, perspective, which is, of course, uh, quite different from uh, China, and it is uh, the perspective of our partners and uh, U.S. and the Western alliance. I wonder alliance. If, if your view, Commissioner, is different to the view of the French President. I'll share some of his language with Politico over the weekend. He said, the great risk that Europe faces is that it gets caught up in crises that are not ours. He's talking about China and Taiwan and potentially just following whatever the United States does. Do you agree with that sentiment? No, I agree on the fact that we should avoid this kind of crisis. But, of course, if this crisis occur, we know which side we are in. I look at Italy, and I have to bring this up, and in American football, this would be called an audible. I'm going to change gears here on what's unspoken. The stunning statistics, and you as former prime minister of Italy can speak to this, of a birth rate in Italy post-pandemic that takes you back to 1861. The demographic driving forces that we face at these meetings are enormous. Are we depeopling the Western world? I think we run a risk. Uh, I think this risk is particularly clear in Europe, especially uh, in Eastern Europe, mm -hmm. but indeed also in uh, my country and uh, other European countries. Uh, how do we um, uh, face this challenge? Well, I think we should uh, continuously look to our perspective in a, uh, not only in a horizontal way. Mm -hmm. so, I mean, Europe and its big eastern neighbor, uh, Europe and Russia. Right, right. We need a, a vertical way, knowing that Europe, the Mediterranean, uh, the Arab world, Africa, this block will have, in 2050, 2.5 billion people. And we need cooperation, legal migration. This is, of course, joined with internal 
policies that are increasing right. demography. This is the solution. Well, the, the also Europe, to the demographic challenge. The European experiment forward has to be, and I percolating out there is an optimism about a better nominal GDP for Europe. Do we still have eurosclerosis, or should I say the risks of eurosclerosis, or have you broken free of that, as John mentions, with a new relationship with China, among others? Well, I think that, well, we, we love uh, living in Europe. Uh, I think it's, um, we are proud of our values, our culture, but we should not um, think ourselves and, if possible, the world to Europe as, well, what a beautiful place with such a good, good values, a wonderful culture, etc. Because Europe is also the place where innovation happens. Are you seeing a new nominal GDP in Europe? Have you broken free from the Eurosclerosis theme of decades? I think there is a chance to do so. Why there is this chance? Because um, I think for the first time, uh, the Europe, I mean, in this case, the European Union, is uh, thinking itself as an actor on the global uh, race to innovation, to clean technology, what in our Brussels language we call uh, strategic autonomy is something completely new for Europe. Mm. Our idea of the European economy was, until three, four years ago, the idea of an economic mm, single market based on competition and open trade, full stop. Now, the European Union, with plans of strategic autonomy is a European Union uh, fighting for innovation. Just quickly here, how much is that new vision at odds with the vision that the United States has in terms of a cohesive trade relationship with China and a cohesive trade relationship across the Atlantic? Well, I think we should be recognizing the fact that we will have in the coming years a sort of uh, race to, to clean technology uh, in the world. A race with the US? A race among the, the, the economic global player. A race for subsidies? The, the problem is to avoid that this become a race for subsidies. And this, the risk is this to avoid is that this undermine the relation with our partners. I'm very optimistic from this point of view because with uh, the Americans, with Canada, with other countries, with Japan, we cooperate very well. Everyone recognizes that Europe has the right and the duty to provide security to, to its own supply chains of the future. I think that this is clear for all our partners. So the problem is how we participate to this race for clean technology without transforming it in a subsidies war and in a tension among partners and without transforming this in a reduction of global trade. Difficult balance to find. But if we don't find this balance, if we don't have global trade for an economic bloc that, like the European Union, yeah. it's a big problem. Commissioner. Thank you. It's Thank you very you. much. Paolo Thank Gentiloni so much. there, the EU Commissioner for Economy and Financial Affairs. Tom, still making things happen in Europe, still difficult. Ask Macron about trying to change the retirement age. How's that gone? The huge challenges in France speak of what would happen if they push it even further country to country. We're counting it down to the opening bow from Washington, D.C. Up next is Jim Bianco, the president and founder of Bianco Research, with equity futures on the S&P positive by four-tenths of one percent. From Washington, this is Bloomberg.
Fed worries about inflation. When nominal GDP growth is weak, they'll have a whole host of other problems to contend with. I don't agree with the view that the Fed's going to be cutting rates by the end of the year. You have a Federal Reserve that says we're not done hiking. We have more work to do. I don't think we should feel comfortable that the worst has passed us. It is particularly a period of heightened uncertainty around the outlook. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, live from the IMF Spring Meetings in Washington, D.C., with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Ramowitz. Live from the nation's capital for our audience worldwide, counting you down to the opening bell over in New York City. Good morning, good morning to you all. An extended edition of Bloomberg Surveillance this morning from the global headquarters of the International Monetary Fund, live on TV and radio, alongside Tom Keane and Lisa Brambitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. Just to give you a flavor of the price action going into the opening bell, equity futures on the S&P 500, just about positive here by a third of 1%. A lift in the equity market off the back of higher than expected jobless claims again. Bit of a sign, an extra sign of softening in the labour market on top of a drop in PPI, the biggest drop in PPI going all the way back to the beginning of the pandemic. So <coughs> yields lower, equities wow. higher, dollar weaker, new intraday high for the year on euro dollar, 110.50. We are positive a half of 1%. There is some real dollar weakness, Tom, in this market right now. Moments ago on the plunge here in DXY, that blended large trading, euro 54% uh, waiting to DXY. You're going to get a 100 handle on DXY just in the last 10 days. That's a substantial 102 down to 101, a weaker dollar down to a 100 handle. We're almost there right now. That's the data behind us. Let's talk about the data in front of us as well. Tomorrow morning, retail sales and bank earnings begin. So a really, really busy morning going into the opening bell. This hour, coming up this hour on Bloomberg TV and on Bloomberg Radio, Jim Bianco of Bianco Research. Richard Bernstein of Bernstein Advisors, Kristen Bidley of City Global Wealth Management, and we'll catch up with the brilliant Raghu Rajan, a good friend of Bloomberg Surveillance over the years. Formerly, of course, the leader of the Indian Central Bank and now leader of the University of Chicago Bull School. I'm very curious about his take on some of the issues that are highly controversial. People are kind of glossing over differences here, but there is a feeling that there is a heated debate of where we're going and how much pain is going to be necessary to get there, and also whether there is the political will to really cause that pain at a time when you start to see inflation uh, impede some of the employment markets as well as some of the other factors that drive day-to-day -day Washington's slowly waking up behind us, I have to say. Yes, you could feel Th it. Things get going at the International Monetary Fund at our headquarters for these spring meetings for the World Bank IMF. Lisa, I have to say the theme so far, there is division between what the IMF says and how politicians respond to it. The IMF says X and politician turns around and says Y, no, I don't agree with you. So basically, you can take whatever data point you want and spin the story you want. So you could say, well, look, at least it's not going to be a super deep recession and we're not going to have this, you know, global more, uh, malaise for a decade. So this is a positive thing. And by the way, we still have jobs. And so things are still chugging along. Or you could look at this and say, we're going to get a new slower growth regime with a more stagflation-like kind of feel for a couple of years. And what that's going to fall into is going to feel different and less pleasant than what we had John, before. Jim Bianco's leadership on Twitter as we've gone through this banking crisis, he's been out front on, look at the BTMM screen, there's lots of 5 percentages out there, but if you get wages to come in, PPI to come in, disinflation, dare I say, what's the trajectory down from 5%, if at all? That's a huge mystery right now. At what cost? And, well, That's the, cost, the question, yeah. at what cost? I don't even think we understand the trajectory of disinflation that we see farther out the curve and certainly within the short-term space. Jim Bianco with us now, the founder and president of Bianco Research. Jim, good to see you, buddy, as always. Let's talk about the data out 34 minutes ago. Just your initial response to it, Jim. Yeah, you, that in the CPI yesterday, inflation has peaked, inflation is coming down. But that's not really the story. The story is... Where are we going in the long run? Is CPI going to go all the way back to 2%? Is PPI going to support that we're going back to a long run rate of 2%? That's the real question. I'm in the camp. We're going to probably come up a little bit short of the 2% target. We've got a big base effect coming because <clears throat> May and June were big inflation numbers of last year. We dropped those off with lower numbers this year. And we might see the low of inflation at the June reading, in Ju which we get in July, and then started to see drift higher. So if we come up short at 2% and we start drifting higher in the second half of the year, 
that will embolden the Fed towards its aggressive policy of higher for longer. So, Jim, can you talk a little bit about how much conviction you feel from Fed officials to get down to 2 percent and the pain required by keeping uh, rates higher for a longer period of time? Oh, I think the conviction with them is very high. I think it comes back to the meeting last year with President Biden in the Oval Office, where uh, he pretty much pointed at Joe Biden. Uh, Joe Biden pointed at Jay Powell and said, it's his job to fix inflation, America. He's going to bring it down. And they're taking that very, very seriously. And they've got a target of 2 percent. And that's what they're gunning for. And there's going to be no backing off of that. So I suspect that, yeah, their conviction is going to stay there. They're going to go uh, hike again. They're going to try and stay higher for longer. The only thing that gets in their way here is if we have some kind of a credit crunch and a big change in the economy in the second half of the year. And to that end, count me in those that think that there's a bimodal outcome. That's a fancy word for saying either the Fed is going to not cut rates at all for the rest of the year, or if they do start cutting rates, they could go 100 or 200 basis points. The expected outcome of that is 75 wow. basis points, which is what the market is pricing in. That's why I said it's bimodal. Either there's going to be nothing or there's going to be a lot, and the market's kind of pricing in so the midpoint of that. Jim, it sounds like you agree with the IMF that we're heading back to uh, an inflation type of uh, environment that we had before the pandemic and that monetary policy could go back to those ultra low rates once this blip is over. Is that right? Sort of. I mean, monetary policy, like I said, if it cut, if you cut it one or 200 basis points, you're still at 3 percent. So we're not going back to zero anytime soon. And I don't think the inflation rate uh, let's say on the long run bait rate gets to 2%. It might get to 2% or lower if you have a recession, but then it rebounds with the recession as well. So yeah, the Fed will respond to that, but the response will not look like a pre-pandemic response of we're going to go back to zero, hold there for many years, and then go engage in money printing again. That era is over because we've got some inflation, and I think persistent inflation above 2%, and that'll limit the Fed as to what they can do. But they can still cut mm. if we see a slowdown. Jim, I want to go to your work through the pandemic. You've been hugely influential, particularly out on Twitter. And this morning, you tear apart the work-from-home certitude, the absolute mystery. It's out there. And I thought it was very comforting, Jim, to see you go after aging boomer managers like Fink and Diamond and say, these guys are lonely. Is work from home going to work? And how does that change the American economy? Oh, I think work from home has to work. And I think it's working in a lot of parts of the economy. Interestingly, where it is getting the biggest pushback is probably large banks and financial services firms headquartered in Manhattan. That is probably the hardest place you're seeing them push <laughs> back from it across the country. And as you move left towards the West Coast and tech, it's the easiest to see work from home. And so it kind of goes all the way across the country in that point. Now, yeah, I think that this is a new evolution in the economy. And simply put, pre-pandemic, you were home two days a week, Saturday and Sunday. Post-pandemic, work from home, remote work, you're home four days a week, Saturday and Sunday, and you're in the office three days a week. If you double the amount of time you're home, you've changed your lifestyle. And that has been showing up in how the retailers have had a difficult time with their inventory over the last year and a half. They're trying to figure out what people buy because their lifestyles change. The economy's changed. We've had supply chain problems as well because a lot of things have changed. This is all part of this post-pandemic economy. And there's one thing, Jim, we still haven't reckoned with. Commercial real estate, residential real estate in cities. You look at the prices still, New York City. Tom, we talk about this so often. Uh, phenomenal median high. rent high, they adjusted? 12 months median adjusted rent in New York City. You need 48,000 a wow. year cash, cash to survive at the median level in New York Jim City. Jim Bianco, how do you make sense of that? Well, I think it's one is a lifestyle. They're both lifestyle changes as well, because to the extent that there is work from home or well, let's call remote work. I don't want to say that everybody's uh, zero five at home five days a week. Uh, there are people that like the, the urban lifestyle, so they move into big cities like Manhattan, and there is going to be a demand to live there, but maybe not go to Midtown to an office in a big tower like we used to have as well. So you have to break down commercial real estate into residential and into office 
And they're two very different markets yep. right now. The office market has been struggling a lot more than the residential market. Hey, Jim, smart, as always. Jim Bianco on form, president of Bianco Research. On the latest gun into the open about about 20 minutes from now, equity futures positive a third of 1%. If you are just tuning in, welcome to the program. Tom, I think we need to talk about this. The banks want people to go back to work. OK. The problem is there are people that are living outside of New York City and they've figured out life's pretty good. Working from home three times a week and I don't have to come to New York City and spend the money. So what's the solution? The solution without question is a two-tier salary there we compensation are. system. Nobody wants to talk about it. Let's talk about I'm it. I'm in a surveillance timeout chair right now, but at some point, and it can go four ways on a game theory basis. Either compensation, work from home is going to go down. Maybe it's level. Maybe it goes up. But there's going to be a premium to be Bramo and have to haul into the office every morning. If you believe yeah. having people in the office <laughs> contributes positively to culture, then you might you're, have to you're pay just for it. Talk to you Bramo. might have you to know pay where for I am on this. <laughs> Bottom talk line, at least so we can well, talk about it. I think we're all on the same page about this. If you want people to live in New York City, if you want them to come into the office five times a week, then there must be a, a way of making sure they're compensated for that relative to the people who have chosen not to come into the office and live in the suburbs and have this wonderful life where they have space and family time You're and sit there. You're talking about 7% of the Americans. <laughs> I'm looking. trying to build a studio in the garage <laughs> well, evidently, in Connecticut. I feel like there's this something is, happening here. The here. <laughs> That's the Honestly, point. look, this is going to be an issue, but Mondays and Fridays, I think, are out of the office, period. And I think that Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday are in the office. And that My is problem is it's an elite discussion. The number one thing they got to solve that we've learned out of this is the child care disaster in America. Yep. That's the number one issue that has to get solved. Richard Bernstein is wondering whether we'll talk about this and not markets. Um, <laughs> we'll decide surely. Richard Bernstein, <laughs> the CEO and CIO of RB Advisors, joining us up next. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. U.S. producer prices fell in March by the most since the start of the pandemic. The producer price index decreased one half of 1% from the previous. Now for the year, the PPI rose 2.7%, the smallest gain in more than two years. All of this is likely to weaken overall inflationary pressures in the coming months. Meanwhile, the White House is rejecting an outlook for the economy by the Federal Reserve staff. Fed minutes published on Wednesday said the staff sees a mild recession starting later this year. But a White House spokeswoman said the data doesn't indicate that, pointing out recent numbers on jobs and consumer spending. Last week's production cuts by OPEC plus nations will lead to a hefty oil shortfall that will grow as the year progresses. That's according to data from the cartel. A new report says world markets may be undersupplied by almost 2 million barrels a day in the fourth quarter. A federal appeals court will limit access to the abortion pill. A three-judge panel partly granted the Biden administration's request to put on hold the Texas court ruling that overturned FDA approval of the medication. On the other hand, it allowed restrictions on abortion that were lifted since 2016 to be reinstated. Delta Airlines is expecting profit this quarter to beat Wall Street estimates. The carrier sees steady bookings heading into the summer travel season. Delta also reiterated its full year forecast of 15 to 20 percent revenue growth over 2022. Global news powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo and this is Bloomberg. We are in this period where, after all the monetary policy tightening that's happened, we are seeing the effect of it because we know all this tightening works with a lag. We are looking at a period where growth in the world is not going to go back to the 3.8%, but more 3%. Gita Gopinathar, the first Deputy Managing Director at the IMF, joining us in Washington a little bit earlier on this morning. Good morning to you. As we count you down to the opening bell about 14 minutes from now, we did have some data out a little bit earlier. Jobless claims a bit softer. The labour market softening may be based on that. I don't know. It's a couple of weeks of this, so keep an eye on it. Outside of that, the PPI data came in. A downside surprise, the biggest drop we've seen, the largest contraction in PPI going back to since the pandemic That's good, actually right? started. Supposedly, 
could be bullish if it continues, if we don't have to pay for it on the GDP side or in the labour market. Equity futures positive by a quarter of 1% time on the S&P. Yields a little bit lower by a single basis point on a 10-year, back below 340, 337.90. And this is the standout this morning, isn't it? It's the dollar weakness, the euro strength, euro dollar positive a half of 1%. Yeah. Let's call it 110.50 on euro dollar, taking out the intraday highs of the years from back in February. The standout for me is the quality of guests we've had. To have the former prime minister of Italy with us, to have John Lipsky with us, Dr. Gopinath, and others. And with Bianco, we haven't let up on the market coverage either. You got you to do that. I mean, Earnings no tomorrow. Retail sales tomorrow. We're going to do that right now. And if you are part of Global Wall Street, you know this. If you're not on radio and television, lean forward for Richard Bernstein to say he's the CEO, CIO, see this, see that of Richard Bernstein Advisors doesn't describe what he did 30 years ago. He launched a book, Style Investing, that was so important, you bought it and walked around with it to be cool, even if you didn't read it. Joining us on value and unique value, Richard Bernstein. Richard, I want to cut to the chase. 28 years ago, when you wrote Style Investing, Apple Computer and four other of their kin weren't 25% of the market. How do you do value investing, Bernstein investing, with the predominance of those major big tech cap stocks? Well, Tom, uh, good morning. And, and I think what, what your comment kind of reflects in the market is the effects of the secular period of, se of disinflation and the secular period of falling interest rates. What we're really talking about are long duration equities. And so just as long duration bonds were the biggest beneficiaries of this extended period of secular disinflation, uh, so were long duration equities. So that's why I think those, those types of companies uh, have expanded so much within the United States. But I do think that we reached the kind of pinnacle of all this you know, several months ago when uh, individual investors mm -hmm. began to take a flyer on every speculative long duration name you could ever think of. I think that was the closing bell, really, so to speak, on that theme. How do you describe constructive value right now? What are the attributes or factors of value that will make money three to five years out? So, so Tom, we, we've coined this phrase that the, the economy, the global economy and the U.S. economy especially, is moving from an environment of cute wiener dogs in the metaverse to real productive assets that we think that is the long-term theme, 5, 10, 15, 20 years, that we are going to face a period of secular inflation, not massive, but let's say 3% instead of 1.5 to 2, and that will uh, benefit uh, assets that, that either benefit from inflation or fight inflation. Right now, those would be mostly characterized as value investments. Richard. As we move from two wiener dogs in the metaverse to something that is perhaps more tangible, how does that affect where we're going to end up with respect to inflation? We're here at the World Bank, people are the IMF, and people are talking about inflation going back to where it was pre-pandemic. Do you agree? I, I really don't think that's going to happen. And if it does happen, it will be for a brief moment because the economy is exceptionally weak. Right? I don't think we're going to have a nice soft landing and no inflation. I think we'll have no inflation, maybe, but that will mean we have a, you know, a pretty good recession. If we don't get a pretty good recession, you're going to have inflation. But, but I think, the, Lisa, the number one factor that caused all this disinflation and this overhang of disinflation in the financial markets was globalization. Globalization just consistently increased competition around the world. And we know when you increase competition, you put downward pressure on prices. It's hard to argue that globalization is still going to expand. I mean, maybe we are going to, you know, all sing Kumbaya and we'll be like the old Coke commercial, you know, holding hands and singing on a, on a mountain somewhere. But I really don't think that's going to happen. And as globalization contracts, we should expect more inflation rather than less because we're going to reduce competition. Uh, let me add one more thing to that. For the United States, that's critically important because of our trade deficit. Nobody cared about our trade deficit and our dependence on the rest of the world for goods while goods prices were deflating. But as it gets harder to find those goods, our trade deficit is going to be very, very important. 
So, Richard, how is the market mispricing this? I mean, you talk about how a Fed pivot seems farther away than is currently thought. How mispriced are bonds and stocks, and which is worse? So, so Lisa, I'll, I'll change this a little bit. I won't say bonds and stocks. I think the asset class that is grossly, and I, I'd say that with a capital G, grossly overpriced are cryptocurrencies. Cryptocurrencies are the ultimate speculative markets. There is nothing there. It is speculation purely for the sake of speculation. Something wild is going to happen in the future, but nobody knows what. Let's go take a, a wild one on this. That's That, I think, is the asset class that's most grossly overvalued. Stocks are more like a seesaw. We have this one group, which we could call tech, innovation, disruption, all the sexy stuff. They're overvalued as well. Not as much as cryptocurrencies, but they're grossly overvalued. The rest of everything else, maybe we should ignore financials for a moment here. Everything else almost around the world is fair game from a value perspective. Richard, what I hear from you to put a bow on it, and great to catch up with you and listen to you as always, is that you think that the IMF is wrong. Is that right? I, I think, um, look, I don't want to, nobody's right 100% of the time. I don't want to say they're wrong necessarily. I do disagree with their assessment that <laughs> we're going to have some kind of, of soft landing and, you know, inflation is going to subside and we're going to go back to where we were. I don't think we are going back to where we were. We're going into some new paradigm. I don't think anybody really knows exactly what that's going to look like, but it's not going to be where we were. And I would argue, Jonathan, the number one factor that's causing that is this contraction, this very gradual and slow contraction of globalization. Richard Bernstein of RB Advisors. Thank you, Richard, as always, sir, for your input. The IMF and its outlook in this piece that it put out early this week when it talked about going back to pre-pandemic interest rates, they acknowledged that that was a risk factor in their outlook, deglobalization, yes. one of three actually, and that was an important one time. The key one was fragmentation. When you talk about this with the managing director, that's the word that comes up. And they're overlaying their caution, unlike Wall Street, with a substantial geopolitical take. And what they're talking about, it doesn't go away. You got the Paris Club, R Wigglesworth today and EFT, the Paris Club, the London Club. Do we need a Beijing Club? You know, I mean, is that where we're heading next? And the conversation we've had increasingly, Lisa, <clears throat> over the last year or so is that there was some kind of secular component to this inflation story, that it would be stickier than some people expect. And that's not exactly backed up by what the IMF is communicating this week. In fact, they're saying entirely the opposite. The interesting thing is it's not just the IMF. The market agrees with the IMF. As Gita Gopinath said, the market's even more aggressive than they are when it comes to how quickly the market the is quickly pricing yes. in yes. inflation coming down rapidly. So here's really the tension. How much conviction can you have to come out and say, this time is different, there is something yeah. new here. Fight what's going on in markets, fight what the IMF is mm. saying, and go the other way. How long can you stand to be I wrong, be potentially, if people are moving of, in the other direction? I'd be in the camp of John Lipsky, which I would be a little humble about looking at the track record of how often I've been wrong on inflation. And as you say, it's the quickly part. It's the adverbs that are going to kill people here. And the track record of this fund, which is hosting us this week, is not exactly great either. Richard's saying we're not going back. We're not going back to pre-pandemic rates. We're not going back to pre-pandemic leadership in the equity market, although that's where the leadership has been here to date. And this is the open debate right now. Kristen Biddley is going to weigh in on this. The head of North American Investments over at City. She'll join us shortly. About four minutes away from the opening bell. Equity futures still with a lift, positive, following that data in America. PPI a bit softer, claims a little bit higher. Equities a little bit firmer, up a quarter of 1% on the S&P 500. Live from Washington, your opening bell, coming up next. Twenty-three seconds away from the opening bell in New York City, from Washington, D.C. this morning. Good morning to you all. As we count you down to the opening bell, here's a flavor of the price action. Equity futures positive, a third of 1%. A lift following the economic data we got about an hour ago on the Nasdaq of six-tenths of 1%. There is your opening bell. Switch on the board and get to the bond market. Take a look at this in the bond market. Yields shaping up as follows. Unchanged, 338.87. But in the FX market, what a move. 110. 50 on euro dollar a new intraday high for the year on euro dollar 110.57 the y 
is in the economic data of 60 minutes ago. Jobless claims a little bit higher than anticipated. PPI a little bit softer than anticipated. If you wanted a reason or two for the Fed to back away, a bit of softening of the labour market, a bit of a sign of disinflationary trends taking hold, you got both of them about an hour ago. How much weight you put on them is for you to decide. So there you go. There's the opening bell. Let's get straight into the market. 30 seconds into the session, your equity market shaping up as follows on the S&P 500, firmer by a quarter of 1% at least. The Nasdaq up by about six-tenths of 1% this morning. Yeah, I'm focused on the airlines this morning when you take a look at what is moving, just simply because we did get those Delta earnings earlier, and they were better than expected when it comes to second quarter projections, and really that seems to be the focus. And you can see after the initial pop, the shares are actually lower, which really is interesting to me, given that we saw them up about 3% half a second ago. And this comes as there is this real tension between people booking so many flights and paying a ton for them, making good margins and expected to. And yet, what do you get with consumer discretionaries if you do get some sort of slowdown, as we see reflected in a tick up in layoffs and a tick up in uh, what the pressures are for the economy? You can see, though, that there still are some gains being held on to American Airlines up about eight tenths of a percent and United up about eight tenths of a percent as well. There are other stocks that are moving, but you know what I find interesting? Sure. Financials aren't moving much. They're pretty much unchanged, maybe up a little bit ahead of the earnings tomorrow. And so I'm really trying to see whether there's going to be some sort of pre-look or gaming out of what we're going to get tomorrow. I can't wait to go through the numbers from the financials, Tom. Not just because I think a lot of people are interested because of the shock yeah. of the last month. I'm actually, actually looking to the big names to see if there are any positives there yeah. for them and how embarrassed they might be of some of the gains they've got Great over the last 30 days from some of the tension we've seen yeah. with the smaller players, the regionals. What I'm going to watch is what they genetically do, like lemmings off a cliff. Oops, things are uncertain. We need to cut costs. And I'm really interested in the cut cost vision. There'll be lots of verbiage to avoid that language, but I really wonder how tight the ship's going to be at some of these major players. One question I've had, Tom, over the last <clears throat> couple of weeks, it was too soon for the Federal Reserve to change its outlook. Its outlook in the summary of economic projections was largely unchanged at its last meeting from the meeting previous to that two meetings ago when they last delivered their quarterly outlook. If it was too soon for them, is it too soon for the C-suite to change their outlook in the financials, given the shock we've had, Lisa, I, over the last four front. weeks? I, this, they'll be out front of the Fed. I would, I would agree, yeah. but I also think we've heard some anecdotal discussions about how credit card spending has come down. We've heard anecdotal uh, conversations about how banks themselves are increasing their credit standards. How much do they increase their credit standards? Are they reducing what they lend? Are they increasing some of the credit loss provisions? What are they doing with some of the loans still hanging out on their books, say, like Twitter? I mean, I'm just curious mm -hmm. what they indicate as they deliver earnings. This industry group, Tom, has said repeatedly, quarter after quarter, for a couple of years now, that the consumer's really resilient. It's got this massive cushion, yeah. a big pool of savings, and let's see if we've taken a big chip away at that in the last quarter. Some of the uncertainty here that we have into the second quarter, dare I say, do we have a vision to Labor Day? I doubt it. Someone who does have a vision to Labor Day is Kristen Bitterly, head of North America Investments at Citigroup. How do you rewrite the year-end outlook, Kristen, right now? What is new in the Citigroup outlook? You know what I think is really interesting, Tom? We have been one of the few firms that has not rewritten our outlook once or multiple times in 2023. We started this year with the belief that we would see a recession and that we would see an earnings contraction of upwards of about 10%. And so that is something that's based on not what we've seen year to date, but actually all of the cumulative impact of this tightening that if you look at any one individual data point, and I know you guys were talking about this a little bit earlier, I think you can start to explain it away or to try to find a narrative. But when you look at all of the leading indicators and all of the data points that we have seen that have shown that we are seeing a decline in economic growth, that still keeps us in our defensive positioning, which is where we started the year and where we're holding on. Right. Well, you've got economists looking for some form of rate stability or dare I say, a set of rate increases as well. How do equities compete with the Citigroup outlook on what short rates will do? 
And this is, I think, the most interesting story that we have seen is the resiliency, or I should say the quote-unquote resiliency, of equity markets. All the volatility has been in the rates market, as you well know, and the repricing of monetary policy numerous times. I think when we break down, though, the story within the equity markets, it is interesting because 92% of the gains that we've seen are really attributed to seven companies, of which about a quarter of that is Apple. When we break down what's been happening under the surface, just looking at Q4 earnings of last year as a little bit of a forecast, Q4 earnings, we had seven sectors already in profits recessions, and that was up from three, four sectors actually in Q3. And so we're already starting to see some breaks under the surface in terms of impacts on profitability, even though the index is telling us a much different story. So, Kristen, with that in mind, going into earnings season, the big banks on deck reporting tomorrow, starting with JP Morgan and others. Just how low is the bar? How low has that bar been set going into earnings season? I think the bar is actually pretty low. So, obviously, there's not a lot of expectation here in Q2 earnings. But I think what you guys were just talking about prior to this segment becomes critically important. For bank earnings, and especially when we're looking at the large banks, I do think that when you look at some of the the stock price performance already and what's been priced in, a lot of we know what's going to happen in terms of whether you're looking at pressures within investment banking, deal making revenues, the limited activity and equity IPOs. And so I think a lot of the discussion is really going to be around what is the forward guidance and what is really the environment that we're talking about, not from a liquidity standpoint, not from a profitability standpoint, but actually about a credit creation and credit availability standpoint, which obviously has important implications for the economy. So how are you going to use this, Kristen? I mean, we talk about how this is going to be the key data point possibly of the week. Forget CPI, forget PPI, forget jobless claims. It's going to be what J.P. Morgan's Jamie Dimon has to say about what he's seeing with respect to lending conditions. From your vantage point, how does that change what you do Monday? So on Monday, I don't think there's a material change in terms of our portfolios because what is going to happen ultimately is we believe that, again, this is not an additive effect of all of these different indicators. There's actually a multiplier effect and there's a little bit of a cycle that we will see. So this idea of us being defensively positioned, and one of the things that I have to mention is it doesn't mean that we're sitting out on the sidelines. It just means that our overweights in terms of fixed income relative to equities, we are leaning into quality, we're leaning into to more conservative positioning within our portfolio. What is really going to turn any type of appetite to be long risk assets? It's going to be ultimately the Fed's trajectory, and it's going to be the signs, particularly what we're seeing, jobless claims, not just initial ones, but continuing ones. Those are really the signposts for us in terms of whether we're going to make material changes within our portfolio. And that can happen relatively quickly, given that cumulative impact of all of those indicators that I just mentioned. Kristen, when people talk about being defensive and having an allocation, perhaps have more heavily weighted duration, I wonder if that still works. Because last year we saw the death of 60-40. This year we see the resurrection of 60-40, maybe, depending on the month. I mean, from your vantage point, are we back to reasserting this sort of ballast of bonds offsetting stocks? I would hope so. I would hope so. But I think the interesting thing, kind of going back to the common equity markets and then the volatility that we've seen in rates markets, when you look at all of the inflows, we could use the proxy, the ETF inflows that we saw throughout the month of March. When you look at those inflows, and there was about 30 billion of, of inflows, 28 billion of that was in fixed income. And where was it concentrated? It was concentrated ultra, ultra short. And then to a certain extent, a little bit longer in duration. And you really didn't see a lot of activity within that belly of the curve. And so I think right now, when you're looking from a flow perspective, there still is, you know, the number one question that we get is, why don't I just hide out in that short end of the curve in cash and kind of wait for some of this future volatility? So I think some of that we're going to see normalize over the next couple of months. But that volatility that we're seeing on the short end is certainly still there. Kristen, last question from us. Favorite idea right now. Kristen, what is it that you're advocating for with clients at the moment? Favorite idea is to, to play a little bit of defense and actually to take advantage of the low volatility environment that we've seen, that if you are someone who's fully invested, you're not trying to time the market, taking advantage of some of the hedges that are available because of this muted volatility is a way for you to actually stay invested and mitigate some of, some of this volatility that we could see and weather the storm what, in what could be choppy markets over the next couple of months. Kristen, thank you. Kristen Bidley there.
of City. Equities right now about nine minutes into the session on the S&P 500 shaping up as follows. We are just about positive by a third of 1%, a lift in the Nasdaq. Is tech defense, Lisa? We've asked that a few times, haven't we? It, and the Nasdaq up nine-tenths of 1%. It wasn't, and now it is. It depends on who you ask. I mean, basically, Tom is trying to create a new need for another yeah, iPhone. Look at the triple so leverage this is basically all cash. triple leveraged all iPhone, right? I mean, but this is really the issue, right? What does defensive mean at a time when I, you have companies that are flush with cash, but they also are interest rate sensitive and have gotten their valuations blown up over the past couple of years? 33 years ago, I went through the same thing. Everybody has these narratives that center around long-term securities theory, you need to be diversified yeah, in a sure. well-balanced portfolio. All these themes, with great respect, they got to go out there and do this, and the clients, the trust funds, the institutions go, yeah, but. <laughs> How did that work there's out last massive, year? There's massive yeah, but. Well, so far, so good in 2023. There is a band setting up behind us here at the IMF Global Headquarters. Yeah, yeah. Jim Bianco of Bianco Research was with us about 20 minutes ago. He said, I didn't get a chance to say it. Pinged me a message on the Bloomberg. He said, the drums over your shoulder on stage have a Live Aid look. Can you sing Radio Gaga for us as well? Would you, would you mind? No I, I, no. no, I can't do that. It's not, it's not, I could do a Willie Nelson thing, but, you know, I don't think crazy. Come on. Nice. <laughs> but, uh, oh, no, but this is, you know, seriously, this is Jerome and the Dot Plots. And what's so great is after the impact of his speech I a think few he was days ago, Queen. Goolsby yeah. is flying in to not, play drums. Not Lady Gaga. Okay, Gary. Oh, Bramo. What was that? What was that? Well, she's, you know, she's a sophisticated on this stuff. <laughs> she's taking... Oh, no, come on, thank you. All right, you've got 30 seconds just to you sit know, there. These guys, they've got to relax. One round, please rescue me. They've got to relax, so this is what you get. Goolsby's playing drums, and, you know, I, I don't know who else is playing. Jay and the Dot Plot. Jay and the Dot Plot. I love that. Mm. I love that. Mm. Raghu Rajan, the former IMF <laughs> chief economist, former leader of the Indian Central Bank, now at the University of Chicago Booth School. Oh, the road again. Joins us next. <laughs> And that's what happens when you push the show into an extra hour. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Applications for U.S. unemployment benefits rose for the first time in three weeks, suggesting some more softening in the labor market. Initial jobless claims increased by 11,000 to 239,000 last week. California accounted for more than a third of the increase. Another missile launch from North Korea, a suspected intercontinental ballistic missile, was fired toward waters off Japan's northern island of Hokkaido. That prompted a brief warning for residents to take shelter from the threat. South Korea says it's possible that North Korea may have tested a new type of solid fuel missile. There was a report on the alleged leaker of those U.S. intelligence secrets. According to the Washington Post, it's a young gun enthusiast who worked on a military base and shared the classified documents with a group on Discord. It's an online platform used by gamers. He was known as OG and told the group he spent some time inside a secure facility. Discord says it's cooperating with authorities. JP Morgan is still reacting to last year's nickel crisis. Wall Street's biggest player in metals has cut dozens of base metals clients and slashed bankers bonuses. The bank was the biggest counterparty of the Chinese company at the center of the nickel short squeeze on the London Metal Exchange. And Apple is accelerating that move beyond China when it comes to manufacturing. Bloomberg's learned that more than 7 billion of iPhones were assembled in India in the last year. Now that's tripling production. Apple now makes 7% of its iPhones in India. Global News powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in over 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo, and this is Bloomberg. not really seen evidence at this stage suggesting a contraction in credit. We have seen a, a couple of data releases that have shown a certain amount of tightening in uh, credit underwriting standards as well as in the overall level of credit. You're being kind because I think she said she saw no evidence of lending contracting and you've said we do. Yeah, absolutely. There is certainly uh, evidence in the data of some contraction in lending and some tightening of uh, lending standard. Some daylight 
between Janet Yellen, the US Treasury Secretary, and Tobias Adria, the IMF Director of Monetary and Capital Markets, earlier on this morning, some daylight between the administration, the Treasury Secretary, and the International Monetary Fund. I think we've all seen that evidence of lending contracting based on some of the data we got Friday afternoon from the Federal Reserve, Tom, and yet the Treasury Secretary <coughs> taking a different look on things at the moment, at least. I see the daylight through the BTMM screen and the Bloomberg. It's real simple. Watch short, short rates through... Uh, in the old school three-month LIBOR and the rest, what competition that is for flows. And you may not get the drama of a number of weeks and months ago in the banking system, failed marketing plans and that, but you're going to get just a persistent challenge is a whole world gets used to the interest rates we studied decades ago. Welcome to the program this morning. If you are just tuning in on TV and radio, an extended edition of Bloomberg Surveillance. Allow me to get you up to speed on some of the price action in the market this morning. The opening bell about 17 minutes ago. Equities with a lift at the moment on the S&P up a third of 1%. Yields a little bit lower by a basis point or two on a 10-year. The standout, a new intraday high for the year on euro dollar. 110.50 plus, now 110.65, positive six or seven tenths of 1%. One hour and 17 minutes ago, we had some data in America showing jobless claims, Tom, a little bit higher than expected. PPI, the biggest drop we've seen on factory gate inflation going back to the beginning of the pandemic. And arguably, that's what the Fed is shooting for. And this is the objective and subsides this morning, at least. And dynamics there with wage growth coming in. And, you know, I said a having. Somebody criticized me for that. Maybe it's not a having, but the disinflation of wages, the disinflation of price, it's tangible. And so far, so good. The equity market likes what it sees based yeah, on the last hour or so. Yeah, we'll, we'll see if this well, sticks. Because had that. I mean, we saw some it, moves it, yesterday that didn't hold, particularly yeah, in the bond market. Absolutely. And people sort of parsing beneath the surface and maybe it doesn't look as soft as people originally thought. Right now this is a joy. As you well know there were 142 books written on the crisis of 07, 08, 09 and singularly definitive was fault lines as we face new fault lines now. The author was Raghun Rajan of the University of Chicago Booth School and his uh, follow-on book The Third Pillar was my book of the summer uh, ages ago. The former head of the Indian Central Bank joins us this morning and we could go for two hours, Raghu, and we don't have it because I know I think you're heading for the airport. So let's get right to it right now. Olivier Blanchard is looking at dynamics of our start and growth. The developed world's looking at this. The emerging market world and their fragilities are looking at it right now. How close are we to an instability of where we need to be versus the growth rate we're going to we hope to see. Well, we have still a economy in the U.S. which is not landing. Right? It's it's chugging along. The first quarter looks pretty good. The problem is more with the medium term. What happens when all the stimulus plays through? What happens when the stimulus right. from the Inflation Reduction Act plays through? Do we slow down? And what you're seeing in many emerging markets is a lot of damage done by the pandemic which is also going to hold them back going forward in terms of consumption, for example. The mm -hmm. lower middle class, deeply hurt during the pandemic, slowly recovering, but it's going to take time. And of course, we've got all these overheads, such as the uh, tariffs, the deglobalization, the conflicts, the attempt right. to... So uh, in terms of longer term growth, it doesn't look good. I think the IMF right. is exactly right. Longer term growth looks uh, mm -hmm. a lot worse. Of course, where our star settles after that, there are conflicting forces. The IMF says low, Larry Summers says high. My sense is low, that uh, yes, you may get an inflation premium tacked on to the real interest rate that right. is equilibrium, but uh, it's right. not going to go back to high levels. Uh, Raga, Tim, Tim from Cupertino emails in. Thanks for watching this morning, Tim. And he says, China and India, you are the number one expert we have in the world on the dynamics of these two great nations versus a new America. Explain to us how you see 24 months out Washington, Beijing, and all of India. Well, I would hope that we don't go down the path we're on with, between Washington and Beijing. That's the key relationship in the world. That is fracturing. I hope they talk more. They're not. They should. Uh, that's, that's important for the rest of the world because if you have to choose sides, uh, countries will be in a very, very difficult position. Of course, there is hope that some country like India will take up the growth engine from China. That's not going to happen for a long time. India is one-fifth the size of the Chinese economy. Even if India grows at, you know, historic China-like uh, growth rates, mm -hmm. which, is, which is still a ways away, uh, and it needs to do lo a lot to get there. 
India is not going to be a substitute for China. What is important is India do what it does really well. India could be a big exporter of services. You're seeing service exports in India go through the roof. And these are things not just IT exports. These are new forms of services. For example, consulting services being produced from India. It's not just the back office of old. It's new you know, consultants actually facing clients. It's lawyers facing clients. That's, I think, a mode for the future. That's going to help growth across the world. Bring us here to the here and now. Back in 2005, you were the head of the IMF Economics Department, and you warned about a banking crisis. Yeah. Larry Summers, at the time Treasury Secretary, called you a Luddite. Do you think that we are on the precipice of some sort of financial crisis or significant credit crunch that is underappreciated? I think we're not over yet. How bad it gets, we will have to see. I think this problem is more systemic. We, we sort of putting it on a few banks, right? These are the guys who splurged, uh, uh, you know, they, they, they didn't do the right thing. The fact is, when you have quantitative easing of the kind we had in the pandemic, you know, the Federal Reserve expanding its balance sheet tremendously. What happens? Well, commercial banks also have to expand their balance sheet. They expand it by issuing uninsured demand deposits. Uninsured de demand deposits went up by trillions of dollars during the pandemic, and they haven't come down. So the sources of fragility are there, right? You're bringing down reserves, but these guys still have a lot of demand deposits out there. Now, we've seen that, of course, where those deposits were invested also matters. If they were invested in long-term you know, securities, you're seeing those losses permeate through the balance sheets of the banks. And there will be you know, problems going forward. The question is, as you pointed out earlier, how does this play out in terms of the credit crunch, which is coming? Are there substitutes? Does private credit, for example, pick up some of the slack from the banking system? That's the big unknown. Uh, accidents, I think we can't say we're over. Are credit crunches inherently disinflationary? They are. They are. I mean, uh, they're going to tighten. It. So you could argue supply side, demand side, right? But I think the net effect is disinflationary typically. So yes, it will do the Fed's job a little for it. But the Fed doesn't know if it's coming. The Fed doesn't know how much. And right now, you know, while the numbers look good, you're still looking at things like services inflation, which is still strong. So the Fed can't relax at this point on the inflationary front, even though, you know, from the credit front, it probably should be a little John, softer. You were really moved by your interview with Raghu's colleague, Luigi Zingales. Frame that with a professor from Booth School. Groupthink, the fate of the Federal Reserve on both monetary policy and on regulation. Do you think that institutions like the one we're in right now this morning, the Federal Reserve, which we talk about often, still suffers from groupthink? And if you do, how on earth are we going to address that? I, look, I think the one thing that seems to be off the table in the discussions is the role monetary policy has played in creating financial fragility, right? We've sort of no. put that off the table. We don't talk <laughs> about it at all. And you have to believe that three crises in, uh, in two decades it has to play, have played some role. And to put it off the table and say, look, it's the private sector, it's the financial sector doing its stuff. They, they've got bad incentives. Well, that's part of the problem. That's not the entire problem. Now we're saying supervisors are also part of the problem. But what about monetary policy? What about, for example, QE? Wasn't that part of what created the fragility that, in fact, we're seeing now? And, and that's why we need organizations like the IMF to start talking they're very hesitant to complain about central banks of the industrial world because those guys have more economists than the IMF sometimes. I hear so, you. Unfortunately, we're out of time, and I could talk about this all day, but it's the establishment view still dominates the conversation, and I think that this institution that we're lucky enough to sit in this morning is, is part of the problem on that front. It, it needs to make a bigger argument. Raghuram Rajan, always fantastic. Raghu. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Raghu, thank you. Raghu Rajan of the University of Chicago. Booth School. Coming up tomorrow, an extended edition of Bloomberg Surveillance once again from the IMF. Gerard Cassidy of RBC Capital Markets. Valdis Dombrovsky is going to be joining us from the European Commission. Mohamed Al Arian with us in Washington. Looking forward to that conversation from DC. This is Bloomberg.